Hi. Good evening, gentlemen. Good evening. It's nice to see you. <laughs> Good to see you. Welcome. <laughs> Jack, I hadn't seen your hair in a while. My gosh. That's Hi, funny. I used to be Jack Kennedy, and now I'm Thomas Jefferson. You are. You are. Yeah. You're completely going founding fathers. I know. <laughs> Keep talking for a second. I have to. I have to help Dana get back into the room here. Uh, I was just going to drape this, drape this flag on my shoulder. That is uh, your your uh, staging is really really excellent. You're like a Gilbert Stewart painting. You just need that, <laughs> you you need that big red um, drape. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Got a purple one. Yeah. <laughs> hey, can you hand me the presidential seal, Mandy? Hey. No. Yeah. No, absolutely. We're gonna do this right. Well, yeah. Good. With a presidential seal. Yeah. Come on. You, you. <laughs> what happened to Dana? We lost. It. Oh, that's so complete. Oh my god. Congratulations. <laughs> well, let me let me take Dana's chair for just a minute. I'm gonna introduce you folks, um, and then. Uh, Omen. Remember. <laughs> Omen. Omen. Yeah. Yes. Omen. <laughs> So let me introduce Jack Holman first. Jack is uh, the political cartoonist, editorial cartoonist at uh, the Sacramento Bee. Um, Jack, you wanna you wanna Pulitzer along the way? Fantastic. It was fantastic. It's fifteen thousand dollars I didn't have before. <laughs> and then Matt Worker, of course, is uh, one of the founders of Politico and the editorial cartoonist uh, there as well. Matt, also uh, you have. Uh, Won a Pulitzer as well, and uh, congratulations! Many years after the fact, but uh, but we're thrilled to have you with us here tonight. You Thanks. know, Matt, I was a finalist with Matt, and he beat me in 2012. This is true. I'm very angry. Still, very angry. Still. Yeah. <laughs> have you have you managed to put it behind you? Yeah. No, I won. He got it. He got it. Yeah. Also, I'm deputy California opinion editor of the Sacramento Bee which means that, you know, I'm an adult. Yeah, not just a cartoonist. No, I'm a way of life. Yeah. <laughs> are we live? We, we are, are live. Oh, there OK. There are 100 people listening. Do not have a moderator? We have Dana. I've, I'm, I'm going to get her on the line in a second. But um, while I get that sorted, can I put up on a screen um, one of your cartoons to, to, to begin with? Do, uh, do either of you have a, a preference? I prefer uh, none of Matt's work be shown. That, put, put, that's up the, my put up the first one, Sandy, of mine. I think I numbered them. Okay, well, here she did. Here we go. Here we go. Coming. There it is. There we go. I thought I, I was trying to figure out what aspect of crisis to talk about in journalism and cartooning in general. And I thought that one thing that strikes me as a crisis that, that's true for all kinds of journalism and cartoonists have to struggle with this too, is this assault on facts, which also means the assault on sort of journalism. And um, right now we're in the midst of that in terms of this election. And um, uh, it, with this cartoon, I was trying to basically, this is a cartoon from earlier last year, but we do find ourselves in a bit of a fact crisis right now. And um, right down to the very question of whether or not we can elect a president and uh, get through a transition and put in a new administration because there's a lot of confusion and there's very, there's very little commonality in accepting facts as facts. So this is an example um, I should also point out of how political cartoons aren't always supposed to be funny. So sometimes we're uh, making you eat your vegetables and trying to make profound um, uh, points in ne not necessarily funny, but, uh, but in colorful ways. I so. I go to the next one. Sure. Everything Matt just said was a lie, incidentally. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. See, it's all breaking down. Yeah, this is going, yeah. yeah. So, so part of this uh, idea about this crisis in facts and crisis in journalism also points to this thing where, I mean, for a lot of us, for most of our careers, I've been doing this for 40 years, um, we, there was a lot of worry about censorship, uh, th that uh, people were gonna come after journalists and sue them for libel and shut them up, or cartoonists in particular, 
sued for slander and libel and things like that. And um, the weird thing is that now 40 years into my career, it's not this kind of libel that you see in this cartoon, which if, if we can get it full frame, I don't know if we can pin it. Um, but this is about, this is a cartoon I actually did about our missing moderator, Dana Priest and some other brave <laughs> journalists who, uh, she's there in the first frame. I'm here uh, now. There you are. Yes. The missing moderator. Yeah, the missing moderator. <laughs> Headline pressure. Yes, hi Jack. <laughs> hi Dana. Hi Dana. Hi. We were, I was, I was doing a little tap dancing here and showing you a couple of cartoons and we've gone off on a tangent, probably not the one you want to be on. Okay, well, uh, I actually did want you to eventually show your, your favorite cartoons, but I have to say, first I have to give a homage, an homage to uh, cartoonists because uh, there've been many times in my life where, not, where there've been some times in my life where cartoonists have really saved me, uh, both, intellectually and emotionally. So first I'm gonna show you the intellectually. Uh, you remember the run up to the war in Iraq and there were many of us at the Washington Post, there were a few of us at the Washington Post to be honest, who were um, trying to you know, tell the truth about um, weapons of mass destruction and we had to be very calibrated and then <clears throat> <laughs> Tom Tolls comes along and does my favorite cartoon of all times. So here's a Scrabble board with the connection finally of Iraq and Al Qaeda. And this is after this is after you've written tens of thousands of words making that point. But then well, Tom not really making that point, hedging on that point because we don't really have you know exactly the evidence. And so that's why I love cartoonists because here the reporters are hemming and hawing and getting, you know, alleged facts and trying to get the real facts and not ever getting the real facts. And then the cartoonists who are reading all of it, I don't know, that's what I want to ask you. Like, what are you reading? They just cut through all the bullshit and somehow get to the truth. So how do you do that? How many things do you read every day in order to figure out, in order to cut through all the bullshit and the hedging that reporters like me have to do? So you said you've loved cartoonists. <laughs> have you ever dated one? They're not no, that but I've been, I've been kissed by one. Ooh, which one? Her block. Oh. <laughs> Her block at 90 under the mistletoe. <laughs> Stay away from those Washington Post cartoon this parties. Yeah, right. well, I, I, you know, uh, <laughs> her block was her block. There were like seven questions in there. Which one did you want? I want to know, like, what do you read in order to get the cojones to cut through the nuance that the reporters are bringing to the story and the editors are hemming and hawing about? And then you're just like, boom. So how do you get the guts to do that? And what are you reading in order to get that? I have bulletproof glass, so it's no problem. Um, number one, um, what do I read? Well, I read Politico. <laughs> and the Washington Post and the University of Maryland Daily Terrapin. <laughs> and the Santa Fe Reporter. I mean, right? You know, Dana, you're, um, you know, around in our ballpark and you know, we used to subscribe to things and they would come in the mail. And now mm -hmm. we read everything and we don't know where it came from. So we're constantly, you know, did I read that in the Atlantic? Was it in the New Republic? Was it in Slate? Was it in Box? Was it in the Washington Post? Was it in my weekly reader? You know, was it in Boy's Life? I don't remember. So, um, I mean, the question was, how do we get the um, cojones, the cojones to just say it, just. Um, yeah, well, I've been sorry to say, and I guess I look like it now with my COVID hair since I can't get to my colorist, but um, yeah. you know, this is, I wanna say, honestly, this is the first time in my career where I have been physically afraid doing my work. Yeah. And the emails that you get from these people are oh. the tone and tenor that are far different 
from the kind of email that you would get during the Bush administration, which was all sporting and golf and Yale and all that stuff. And so prisons and, and well, whatever. Yeah. Okay. I would also like to point out McClatchy was all over that in 2003 as well. Um, taking one for the team here. So, but I think that this is a very dangerous moment and we're not through it yet. And it will continue to be dangerous for commentators mm -hmm. and cartoonists and reporters. Mm -hmm. and quite frankly, I've been rather amazed that there haven't been acts of violence for TV people or cartoonists. That's so far so good. Yeah. Well, first of all, I hope that you are telling your editors and they're getting you the right security because every one who works for anyone deserves that. Uh, and that's totally possible. And it's also uh, their responsibility. But okay, I'm gonna try this with Matt. The same I've question. asked for bulletproof limousine. Nothing yet, I don't know. Yeah, okay. <laughs> So Matt, how do you get the gumption up to just dive in there and say what the reporters can't say, you know, because they haven't got maybe the final facts? Well, that's that's our job as political cartoonists. I mean, you know, yeah. I, I grew up with role models like Conrad and like Herb Block and um, always wanted to be like those guys. And that's, you get up and, you know, like uh, Herb Block coined the term McCarthyism, before, at the very beginning of that mm -hmm. whole episode with Joe McCarthy, and uh, now we're at Kevin McCarthyism. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> we are. We are. California well, humor. Yeah. It's, so, but that's but that is our gig, and uh, and we get a certain amount of latitude in terms of we can play faster and looser with the facts, obviously, than the reporters or even the people writing the editorials. Um, and there's a wonderful thing about visual imagery and joking around, um, you can uh, uh, get out there on limbs and uh, you can say things implicitly, but not overtly. And- um, oh, can, you, can you show me an example of that, both of you? Oh God. Or okay. one of your favorite cartoons. Do you have one there? That well, you Sandy, might put what, up? What, Cindy, what do you have next um, after that one? Or we should show one of Jack's actually. I've got yours lined up first. Okay. This is- this is, uh, uh, this is actually, uh, I thought that maybe one of the crises we could talk about too is the crisis in journalism and the lack of jobs for uh, cartoonists and journalists in general. And we're sort of an endangered species in that we've been, our ice oh, flow, great. Oh, you see the little labeling there? Yeah, yeah. yeah. This one, this one. Label it in gene, endangered species. That's kind of an insider thing though, right? That is a little bit insider. And this one probably wouldn't upset anybody other than polar bears who are being compared with journalists. Yeah, the Washington crowd would get it. Yeah. But how about, a, how about one of Jack's cartoons? Sure, give me a second. <laughs> okay, in the meantime, oh, there we go. Nope. There it is. No, oh, now I'm going to have to put on my glasses. <laughs> this Don't. is why I hate showing cartoons during. That's right. It's going to come full frame. Just sec. Oh, uh, be... yeah. Ugh. I can put it full screen. Yeah. Is that better? There it is. Yeah. Don't be afraid of COVID. Don't let it dominate your life. Mm. The thing about Donald Trump. Um, is that he, he he writes our punchlines for us. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's an exact quote. And so we're not cartooning anymore, we're illustrating. You know, Mike Peters, one of our nation's truly great cartoonists, uh, who's been doing this for since 1968 or nine, I think, he said during Watergate that every cartoonist was brilliant. And in the Trump era, every cartoonist is brilliant in some way. Mm -hmm. And I think the true test of a political cartoonist, frankly, is when things are, are boring. Yeah. And when, you know, remember when nothing was going on, Matt, you mm -hmm. know, and, if, and you do a cartoon about the Federal Reserve and you'd be yeah. slaving away over that <laughs> Greenspan caricature, the drawing of the Federal Reserve building. And you're like, well, maybe something will happen tomorrow. And you know, we used to be on a, a 
you know, a handleable print product news cycle. And now we're on a Twitter 15 minute news cycle. I can't tell you how many stories I've missed commenting on because, you know, Mattis in the morning and Bannon in the, you know, 20 minutes later and, and Corey Lewandowski for lunch and it, all of it. And it's like, I have, I barely drew, drew Jim Mattis. I've barely drawn Bill Barr, I, you know, because it's going by so fast. And yeah. it's like, uh, you know, we're like trout. Well, we, sorry. Are you getting... We're like trout. We, and it's like all these bugs are living. <laughs> oh, fly fishing analogy. Okay, are you going to get ready? Are you getting ready for boring Biden, though? Well, I, you know, look. I mean, compared to Trump. Oh, come on. Listen, number one, here's the deal, okay? Number two, it's not going to be a boring era. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's okay. true. Come on, man. <laughs> That's true, it's going to be a boring era. It's going to be a very interesting era. It's going to be um, a, you've got two sane people who are going to be president and vice president of the United States. And when you watch Trump give a news conference, it's like somebody's on Adderall and, um, you know, speed and, and, you know, and he's senile and he's crazy all at once. And Biden got up and I know that I have been craving boring for four years, you know, just give it to me, just bore me, you know, Gerald Ford me, you know, just I, I whatever it takes, I don't care. I wanna be, I wanna watch a presidential news conference and not have adrenaline in my mouth when I'm watching it. And I remember, what, let me tell you something. I remember watching that first news conference that that, uh, that that Trump did, and I was afraid. Like I thought, this guy has the football, you know, and he's in front of the, the, the 37 CIA officer stars in the lobby, and he's talking about how many electoral votes he got and stuff like that. And you just think, I, I, I don't, I hope that I can't feel a nuclear weapon go off in Sacramento because that's how weird it felt you know that we were in imminent physical danger mm -hmm. and we got 72 days to go or something so god willing we'll get through it well there was the i mean there's the gut uh, gut wrenching worry part of trump but the other part of trump is that um uh i mean and i think this may have uh, factored into tom toll's retiring even before election day from the washington post but he's broken cartoonist where we become these lazy, you know, if you go camping and they tell you not to feed the bears at the campground. <laughs> the, we've been like the bears at the campground for four years of the Trump administration. Wake up in the morning, turn on Twitter, and everybody's upset about some stupid garbage that has nothing really to do with the you, know. you only do three cartoons a week, man. I'm working for a living out here. So how are you, so how are you preparing for boring Biden? And also, are you going to be as critical? I mean, obviously, they're sane people, like you said, but still, are you going to feel a little bit reticent to totally chop them down because they're... Because I'm so deeply relieved that the American democracy exactly. survived. Maybe for up to them a little honeymoon period for yeah, that. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, well, That's again... very funny, though. Well, I think Biden is funny, you know, I think, I, I hate to talk about that because it, you know, it's very reductionist. And yeah. you know, my daughter's a big Warren person. And she said, you know, look, I'm an opinion journalist. I like Biden the whole time. I'm, and I'm proud of it. Okay. And she said, well, why do you want Joe Biden? He's so old and so boring. And I said, well, he's been a United States Senator since Hubert Humphrey was in the Senate, number one. He's chairman of the uh, Senate Judiciary Committee and chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee. And then he was vice president of the United States under the first black president of the United States. Mm -hmm. What do you want? Mm -hmm. This is, this said, is what yeah, he's he's so old. Old. You know what? He's not too old. He's just fine. 78 is the new company. I don't know. But, well, I'm sorry. Do you think you'll be able to make fun of him? Of in course. The 
cartoonist too? Okay. Yeah. No, I, I've done cartoons about like when he did. Uh oh, I lost somebody here. No, we're we we're, see you. We see you. Yeah. Okay, I lost my screen, so I need to sign back on. Um, the question was, um, while well, I'm trying to type in my password. Um, yeah, how do you? Okay, here. So, Biden, Matt, help me here. Remember, he, you know, he talked about the record player. Biden talked about the record player. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Another one. Right. He's like, oh my God. You know, he referred to a, you know, downloading TikTok or whatever the hell it is now. And I'm like, I like a guy with a record player. You know, I got a dual 1229 in my living room, you know, okay. and maybe it's time for a guy with a record player instead of a Twitter account. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What about you, Some Matt? You gonna, jokes. I mean, really, how are you going to hold back because you don't want to eviscerate no. it right in the beginning? No, 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 I don't think okay. so. I, mean, I think that we'll actually be able to get back to some, you know, matters of substance and um, maybe even talk about sort of big picture things like actual health policy and public options and what we do about military spending in this country and stuff like that. I mean, but now you're talking like a journalist. How are, do you feel free to critique what they do on all those things? I, I you know, every cartoonist serves at the pleasure of their publisher. And um, I, I mean, who works for a newspaper, I mean, yeah, a lot of our compatriots are, you know, freelancers and they're free of that, but I have complete free reign. I mean, I, I, I my, my editors um, let me do anything I want and any topic I want. And a lot of uh, cartoonists operate that way. And um, it's really the only way to work. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, I, I mean, the, the, the nut of your question is, are, are, are we going to comment on Biden or criticize Biden? Um, I think the question is, is there going to be conflict in Washington? Did the Republicans run the United States mm -hmm. Senate? Is it very, very close in the House? Yeah. Are we, you know, come on out to California and tell me about climate change. You know, I was locked inside for a month and I am not kidding. I went outside two times yeah. physically. So I'll be talking a lot about climate change. Yeah. You know? yeah. And there was like ash at the bottom of my swimming pool. You know, there was, I mean, you know, poor me, right? But, you know, we're in a really bad situation. And just because yeah. Joe mm -hmm. Biden got elected, eh, I don't think we're out of the woods yet. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Okay. Good point. Although, although, Dana, it will be interesting. I mean, like when Obama first became president, cartoonists had to sort of grapple a little bit with with uh, being careful about anything that was racially tinged with Obama and people got over it pretty quickly. And I think with Biden, there's a certain amount of the easy, the low hanging fruit with Biden is to make fun of his age. Right. And, um, and it, hopefully cartoonists won't go there. Um, well, although, you know what? I mean, Trump is 74, okay? Right. Um, Eisenhower, I rem remember Eisenhower, Matt, when we were growing up, and you know, like he's alive. I saw the, the the fighter jets coming over my house in Springfield, Virginia, from his funeral at Arlington. I'm not kidding. And he was 69 when he left office. And I'm like, 69, man, that's like a spring chicken in this medical environment. Now, I mean, the guy had had like two heart attacks when he was yeah. president. No, but there is, right. I mean, but that does bring up maybe old age is a fair target because the you know the leadership of the Democratic Party in particular. But Donald Trump is old too. But you've got Nancy Pelosi, Chuck Schumer, yeah. Clyburn. If there is a general okay, but old does not have to be bad. It could be wise. No, that's, yeah. you answered your own question, Dana. Right. Yeah. Right. I'm okay, six. Have, look, we have another um, cartoon up there. Yeah. Can we get a full screen? This one. The originalist justice. Jack, you're going to have to read this one. Yeah. If it comes full screen. Well, if I can see it, I will. Is that better? No, there it is. Right. Well, this is about, you know, originalism and basically I think how stupid it is. And we don't hold original thoughts in our day-to-day -day life for more than an hour. You know, if we did everything like it was in 1789, as this cartoon illustrates that uh, you know, we would be viewed not only as antiquarian, but insane. And so 
I get original intent. Um, and, you know, I don't know that there's a lot of cartoonists doing jokes about original intent, but this one just drove me crazy when, when Amy Barrett got up there and, you know, I don't even want to characterize the remarks other than ridiculous. Um, but there's this fetish of, of originalism. And, you know, we can't divine what the original uh, intent was of people who've been dead for 200 years in a lot of ways. Sometimes we can, um, but now that this election is over, we see that there are vast tracts of parts of the constitution um, where we don't know about uh, the electoral college and then going to these, you know, the legislatures and putting up their own slates of electors and so on. And it, it's like tarot reading backwards and through a crystal ball with, you know, blinders. I just, you know, so I'm very frustrated with originalism. Matt, what do you think about originalism? <laughs> um, um, I, uh, was the Thomas Jefferson quote about, you know, uh, uh, children's clothes that if, as the child grows, you have to change the clothes to in the Jefferson Memorial. I, um, <laughs> I, I should do a better job of quoting it. Um, well, I mean, originalism, you know, there are constitutional amendments that have been as recently as, um, when was the last one? Was it 66 was the last? constitutional amendment, I think. Good question. I that was the presidential succession because they didn't have a clear path after Kennedy was killed. If I'm not a Harvard Law graduate, okay, right. but um, they couldn't get, you can't even get a constitutional amendment to say that women are equal. Uh -huh. They haven't ratified the ERA. That was at the beginning of my career. Hmm. So, you know, work on that. Yeah. Can I um, show my next favorite cartoon? So it's not going to really matter. This is by Nick Anderson, and it's just a cartoon about secret prisons. Yes, something okay. near and dear to your heart. It's really near and dear to my heart because I felt like, uh, because I was getting so beat up by everyone except uh, the human rights people, even the Democrats, they said nothing. And um, when I saw this cartoon, I just thought, okay, someone's making fun of this, it's going to be okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, you know? wow. Great. It was like an emotional, I don't think it's the best cartoon in the world, but the fact that it existed just yeah. relieved me of this huge cloud. You know and what happens when you show two cartoonists who you're interviewing about their work and you show another guy's cartoon? You know, we do. <laughs> no. We look at it and go, and the perspective was screwed up. That lettering was lousy. That was a crappy caricature. Right. I could have I could have done a better elephant. I could have done a better elephant. But my question, oh, yeah. my question is, uh, have you ever kind of hesitated on an issue that you thought was just either too, I don't know, national security, too heavy, uh something that you just, you, you wanted to say something, but then you just said, well, the time's not right. I got this Jeffrey Tubin idea. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That I just can't do it, you know? Mm. There's lots of cartoons that we walk away from. I yeah. mean, that's, we're our own worst editors. And- like, uh, you Walk away from what kind of cartoons? Cartoons you do, but you say that's not gonna go over well, or- it's Well, Raw? Okay, try this on for size. Um, I still think that there are two types of political cartoonists in this country, serious cartoonists and cartoonists who are just spooning out obituary cartoons and gag lines about Jeffrey Tubin and crap like that. And mm -hmm. one of the things I'm proud of my friendship with Matt Worker and a lot of other cartoonists who actually think about what they're doing and issues and things like that is that, you know, they're informed by, you know, careful consideration of issues. And so, you know, do we walk away from ideas all the time? Uh, I can remember when um, uh, the Reagan administration wanted to do uh, a urine 
testing for drugs. And I, Christ, you know, it's just like, is this where we are? Are we doing pee cartoons, you know? And then the Trump thing and the tapes. And so, I mean, I've just seen the most, you know, and I'm not a, like a complete fuddy-duddy on this sort of thing, but you know, I'm from Minnesota. And so people from Minnesota are a little, you know, hinky about pee cartoons. And so when we had this moron who just lost the election, you know, just pushing the envelope of taste and, you know, every other boundary, I, I get really kind of prudish almost about my work. Mm -hmm. Matt, have you Matt ever, does too. And Matt, I think that a cartoon that you I'm speaking to Matt now. Matt. What? <laughs> was... Have you have you um ever like thought about a great idea and said, oh it's it's all the all all the time, but but usually it's not because it's too radioactive a, an issue. It's it's usually like Jack was talking about, it's it's a matter of taste. You sort of go, nah, this is this is over the line and it, you know, a pea cartoon or something like that. You, you know, a good cartoon often will, will, will walk right up to the line of being distasteful. Yeah. Um, although so I have to say that- Did you both not do the golden showers? No, no, I did not do a golden shower. No, there was none of those, but- Can we just but, move the hell on here? <laughs> but I do, I do have to say that like over the last couple of years, I've struggled and I've argued with some of my cartoonist friends about using Nazi imagery in their cartoons in relation to what the Trump administration's up to. This question of mm. what's the law, you, you know, if you, if, if you compare someone to the Nazis, you've lost the argument. Um, well, yeah. Uh, not more as I, well. You know, I only did one before the 16 election. Right. And I don't think, I, I can't even remember. I, I mean, I just drew Hitler doing something and somebody, you know, it was kind of the, one of my specialties, historical analogies. <laughs> like my hair um but you know but i haven't done the i don't think i've done the armbands and the boon rallies and you know all this stuff and it's like uh, we ain't there yet okay no, no. although although the, you know the bit the last couple of weeks have sort of pushed that envelope a little bit no, we're just like the Ceausescu's. It'll be fine. Yeah, yeah, we're, we're in the Mussolini territory. An armband is acceptable, maybe not a person. No, I think if this guy had been reelected, I was strongly considering just quitting. You know, mm -hmm. I'm out. Just mm -hmm. screw it. You know, mm -hmm. if this is where this country's at, um, you know, I'll just go write press releases for somebody. Are you, you going to move overseas or something? Why were you? This would be the greatest moment. Yeah, Oregon. <laughs> <laughs> No, I don't know. No, because it's like, wh why do I want to ex expose myself constantly to these idiots, mm -hmm. you know? And if I'm just like in an environment where the free press is becoming a joke and free mm. speech is a joke, and um, then what am I doing, you know? Yeah. But I'm not, so I'm staying. So can I ask you a really, uh, basic question about when do these ideas come to you? Like <laughs> when you're dreaming, when you're cooking your breakfast, when you're showering, when do they come to you? All of those, all of those times, those, those are all really good creative times. I used to ride my bike to the newsroom back when we worked in offices and often I would get my idea on the bike ride into the office. I'd, or I'd have the edge of an idea and in the course of getting, pedaling my way to the office, it would sort of fully cook. So what about now, under uh, COVID? Uh, uh, I, have to walk, I have to walk around the block vigorously or whatever. I mean, With the know, I, I don't know about you, Jack, but I, I mean, having been at this for 40 years, a lot of the ideas actually do come in my sleep. I'll wake up in the morning and there'll be like a weird cartoon metaphor sitting there right next to my fear of falling or, you know, I've had a hell of a time sleeping the last couple of months, mm. and I can't quite put my finger on it, but I just turned 60, and I think that has something to do with it, but I was up at, oh, did I lose you guys? No, you're still here. Okay. My computer is just doing crazy junk here. Okay, here you are. Um, I got up at 3.15 Pacific mm. time. 
I thought, you know, I don't think I'm going back to sleep. And maybe I fell asleep at nine o'clock, right? So I started doing my Sunday rough. I got to do two cartoons today and one's rather elaborate. Um, and the premise was, you know, what, and I thought of it sitting in the bathroom at 3.30, what will the Kamala Harris vice presidency look like going forward, mm -hmm. right? So right. what that is, is it's a, it's a writing prompt. That's it. It's not rocket science, okay? You have a premise. And then all you're doing is writing six jokes off the premise. And so, so I did that. And then the other day, and I know I don't look like a golfer, but I am. And uh, I said to my golf partner, you know, I was watching Trump out in the rain at Arlington, you know, soiling himself and uh, with his bone spurs. And I thought, you know, he's, he's at the tomb of the completely known election outcome. <laughs> that was right? And so that's all you're doing is illustrating a phrase. And so Matt can tell you, I don't get visual ideas. I get the writing prompt. I have the phrase and then the drawing is like nothing to me. Huh. Or it's not really a thing. It's just, it's automatic. It's enjoyable. It's pleasant. It's, but you have to kind of be in this Zen weird, let it happen to you state to get really good ideas. And the so, second you sit down and go, I'm going to get an idea, you know, it's like. A, a, where else it's have you perfect. gotten great ideas just to help us? Where? Yeah, you said you were in the bathroom for that one. Where else? <laughs> well, it was on the bathroom. <laughs> in the bathroom, okay. In the bathroom, having a cup of coffee. Okay. Um, to keep quiet, because my wife had, was going to sleep another five hours. Um, <laughs> that's not, I mean, I don't think that's a relevant question. The question is, how do you prepare yourself to be in a position to get the idea? It's okay. not where, it's almost okay. like, you know, you're relaxed, you're, you're free associating. That's the job. We're master free associators. Yeah. And if you were in a group of like four or five really good political cartoonists, you would find it very entertaining because like ping, 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 you know, and I'm really dumb at math. I'm really dumb at a lot of things, but I'm really good at ping, 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 ping with other cartoonists. Yeah. <laughs> or, or on uh, your own in the back. Matt was saying he gets it riding his bicycle yeah. to work, or he did. And cartoonists yeah. talk to each other. I talk to Matt constantly. We text each other constantly. I send him roughs all the time. <laughs> I do, I do. I, he doesn't send me anything. Jack, hey, Laney, Jack is texting me with an idea. Yeah. <laughs> not not one that you want me to draw. It's it's your idea. Just to be clear here, you're not feeding me ideas. No, but I'm like, I'll say, hey, what do you think? And you know, there are a couple of other cartoonists. I'll do that. Yeah. Do you zoom with them, or do you just? Uh, ah, no. I hate zoom. Okay. Christ. Yeah. Zoom is the oh. worst. I love this journalism. Look at that. Oh this, my God. Yeah, and is that full frame? I don't know if you can see it, but yeah, this is just, I was trying to provide some cartoons that were on the topic of crisis and the crisis in journalism and the crisis in whether or not people can rely on the news or where they find their facts and how the facts are getting choked off basically by um, a whole lot of noise and uh, Hmm. Some of that is structural and some of that is, uh, is intentional, you know, mm -hmm. Steve Bannon famously uh, basically said, uh, we're going to like confuse everybody by flooding the zone with bullshit. And uh, that's what they're doing right now, they're, right now this week is uh, yeah. we can't get into a normal transition because uh, it's everything's been flooded by bullshit. Yeah. So we have a bunch of students in the audience. Oh, I should. Oh, I'm glad we were swearing. Oh, good. Sorry. Oh, Thanks no. for the. No, 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 no. Um, it's all good. They're not yeah. I just wanted to ask you what advice you would give them if they, you know, had, if they're thinking about cartooning, if they get out, get out, get <laughs> out. It's dead. Go, go get a law degree. No, no. There's 25. Listen, Dana, there's 25 cartoonists full-time in the United States. When I started, there were 250. There are two full-time cartoonists in California. There are no full-time cartoonists in the state of Texas, okay? 
So like what I would tell them is it ain't going to be political cartooning. It's going to be, you know, you can do online stuff. It, it's just, you know, God love this profession. I love it. it. It is a sad thing. And, you know, I could spend 20 minutes telling you who killed political cartoon. And maybe I will. But oh, the yeah. fact is that I would not recommend any young person go into political cartooning at all. Maybe period. it'll make a comeback. You don't see, think it'll make a comeback? I'll, 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 I'll yeah. take the other side. Okay. I'll, take, I'll, 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 I'll be uh, the good cop in this one. Okay. So political cartooning that's based in newspapers is definitely going away. But political cartooning or expressing your ideas to large audiences with visual humor and everything like that ain't going away. In fact, I think that it's going gonna, it's gonna to evolve into something different. But the idea that you get to be a Herb Lock or a Tom Tolles or a Jack Omen and get a, an office and a job and, and, and health benefits, hmm. that's going away. But that's sort of true for a whole lot of the, the economy and a whole lot of journalism in particular. Let um, me tell you something. Yeah. I have survived in this business, Dana, for 42 years. And when I started, I was doing five cartoons a week at a print product newspaper, the Columbus Dispatch, uh, right across the street from the state capitol in, uh, in Columbus. And 40 years later, I had to become, you know, an editorial writer, a columnist, an animator, a, you know, visual commentator online. Go, you know, I do like, I have like seven jobs now. And I'm deputy editorial page editor of a major newspaper. <laughs> Just survived this. Well, you laugh, but it's no joke, lady. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> you know, I ain't dumb, okay? Yeah. And a, a lot of our very talented cartoon colleagues have fallen by the wayside because they're like, I'm not going to do anything else but draw five cartoons a week. Okay, well, very good. You can go do that and, you know, while you're working your job at, as a Walmart reader, you know? And <laughs> so... I would like to hear you um, or have you write that story about who killed cartoonists because I think you have some uh, specific people in mind or something. Sure. So, yeah. Well, I, I mean, do you want the short version as the if I'm capable? Yeah. Yeah. The, yeah. Um, the first yeah. thing, look, there are a lot of courageous editors out there. I will give you, um, I'm not going to name the guy, but uh, he was editorial page editor of the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel. And, oh, five, five years ago, oh, Mr. Oman, I love your work. We're running your work. You know, he was very big in uh, uh, NCW, the National Council of Editorial Writers, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, and he was, like, oh, and then, a year later, he writes this editorial um, and says, uh, we're not going to run cartoons anymore because we find them too controversial, basically. No. And it was like, you, eh, you know, yeah. you were like blowing smoke up my you know what a year ago. And now you're literally not running any cartoons at all. And that is a not uncommon feature of a lot of newspaper editorial pages now. Yeah. And yeah. Um, you know, without going too far down the road here, there are a lot of, you know, um, you know, my company has been extremely supportive of editorial cartooning. Uh, we have a couple of full, you know, and I would define somebody who's an editorial cartoonist in this business, you know, you got a dental plan, you're an editorial cartoonist, okay? Mm -hmm. And, you know, and Matt has a great commitment from Politico and um, they're gonna hire a new cartoonist at the Washington Post mm -hmm. and, you know, God bless them. There mm -hmm. are still some of them, but there are a lot of them at some of these other groups that are like, and eh, you know, we got to pay this guy 72 five and you know, cartoonists, come on, you know? Mm -hmm. And so you make yourself relevant by the quality of your work and how you say your, you know, your, your, your thing. And um, yeah, I was doing so well until the end of that sentence. <laughs> so Matt, do you think, do you think cartooning is going to make a, well, you've kind of already said it, but so if someone wanted to make a living out of cartooning these days, what would they what would they really have to do? I think, well, it's related to what Jack was saying. I mean, you need to have a lot of tools in the toolbox. You need to learn sort of the technology, the digital technology, be really conversant in it. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, I mean, right now, uh, you know, Jack or I can do a really brilliant cartoon and it appears in a newspaper. 
and then maybe it goes up on social media and several thousand people will share it or something like that. And then you look at these people who've cracked the code on memes, right? Yeah. On Instagram and stuff like that. And a lot of that stuff, they're basically, they're just one step away from a political cartoon. They're just using mm. photographs and stuff. So yeah. there are, there's, a, there's a big audience for this thing that cartoons have been doing for 400 years, which is, this, as you said in the beginning, distilling something down yeah. and hitting you in the face with a, a, a real punchy image that people process in three or four seconds. And um, that thing, that means of communicating, those little juicy nuggets um, that used to be drawn by people who created images with their hands, are now being created by people who use all these other tools and then distribute them in this fabulous and frightening new world where if you've got a Facebook page or a little publication in Denmark, um, you put that thing up there and the whole world is watching and this stuff goes viral and a lot yeah. of, you know, ideally it's enlightening people and um, other times, like in the case of the Charlie Hebdo stuff that's going on right now, um, it en enrages and inflames things. And um, it's a whole new crazy world. Hmm. Can I just jump in really quickly? Pat Talamanis is listening to this. He's very active in the, the Santa Fe group. And uh, he was CEO of McClatchy. And Pat Talamanis, there's probably no greater supporter of American editorial cartooning than Pat Talamanis. And I was hired, uh, sadly, um, after our dear friend Rex Babin died, and it would have been very easy for Pat Talamanis and the editor and the publisher of the Sacramento Bee to say, you know what, okay, that's over. And Pat Talamanis said, okay, we got we to gotta look at this guy, let's hire him. And they mm -hmm. did it. And mm -hmm. there are courageous guys like Pat out there who are still doing that. Yep, yep. And it comes down to smart, courageous editors who understand the, the utility of cartoons and, uh, you know, editorial pages can get really boring and lots of uh, gray space with people droning on with long essays and stuff. And the smart editors um, throw some cartoons in there and make it lively and maybe use it on social media too. This is a cartoon I start out with. This is, uh, that's actually Dana in the um, first frame there. This is back when you were getting in trouble for your black sites. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, I dug this one out of the archives. That's nice. I'd like to have a copy of that. I'll send you Committing one. Committing acts of journalism. Yes, exactly. Well, okay. I was getting harassed a lot back then, and you, you, uh, Jack, you mentioned it. And I'm sure that Matt, you, I remember a couple episodes where you got into big trouble with the online harassers. Um, yeah. Do you uh, have you actually felt threatened in a way that you could afford? Or do you can you just not read the online crap and go go along in your life? Let me tell you a story. I did a cartoon about Governor Rick Perry uh, weeks after I started at the B. <laughs> don't don't mess with Texas. Okay, yeah. and um, it was about the Waco explosion and how ultimately you know they had all these safety violations and. Uh, so anyway, um, this they, imagine getting up at eight o'clock in the morning and turning on CNN and seeing your name on the CNN crawl uh, that said, you know, Governor Rick Perry calls for firing of Sacramento Bee editorial cartoonist. Mm -hmm. Good morning, right? And I'm just up to get coffee, right? And so then Ted Cruz called for my firing. And then uh, the Lieutenant Governor of Texas uh, called for my firing. And wow, you should have seen my Twitter feed. And um, they don't threaten to kill you. What they say is they're going to drive up I-40 and come and pay you a visit, okay? Mm -hmm. And so they called my son, they found my kids, they, okay. you know, all of it. And hundreds and hundreds of tweets and Ann Telness has gone through this with Ted Cruz again, you mm -hmm. know, where uh, they put out their little, you know, uh, uh, um, dog whistle and their yeah. uh, buddies out in the ethernet, um, you know, come in like the flying monkeys. So yeah, it's, it's concerning. I'm so sorry about that because really it's, it's, it's just unforgivable. It's just unforgivable. So, yeah. um, okay. We're gonna have some Q and A now. 
with our yeah. audience. So let me and jump. Do I have to take this or you're going to tell me? I'm going to leave. Uh, Sandy's going to come in and do the questions. I'm right, gonna, Sandy? Yes. Are I'm going to leave these up on the screen while I ask them because I realized that I, they were not as full screen as they are now. Um, let me ask you, Matt, a quick question. Um, what's What kind of pushback have you gotten for your work? Or, you know, you said before that cartoonists draw at the uh, pleasure of their publisher. What what kind of heat have you taken for some of your work? You mean from the publisher? Or, you mean or beyond? Well, I mean, it, it's pretty much like what Jack was just describing in, with his episode with uh, Texas and Rick Perry. I mean, these days it takes the form of social media pushback. Um, in my case, I have very smart editors who sort of understand how to handle this stuff. And they, they, uh, they handle it great and I have their full backing and stuff like that. A lot of cartoonists don't. Um, and then, you know, I mean, I think of uh, Rob Rogers who lost his job in Pittsburgh because the publisher wanted him to do more pro-Trump stuff. Um, I mean, the fact of the matter is that, that, that in traditional news media, you, all journalists work at the pleasure of the publisher. You know, free press is great if you own one. Um, uh, <laughs> Yeah. So that's true of reporters and cartoonists alike. The, 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 the lucky ones like myself end up with uh, open-minded publishers that realize that you do your best work when you're off the leash. One question comes in, which is, do you have a pile of stock cartoons you can pull up for the days when unbelievably nothing is happening or your inspiration isn't clicking? Jack, how do you feel about that? Um, I'm not seeing anything in terms of your face here, is that me? No. Um, yes, no, I mean, I, I, I'll tell you the most useful tool I have. Um, Matt must have sent 7,000 cartoons. Um, is my phone. And all day I'm constantly sending myself texts with the phrases that I had talked about earlier. That's enormously important. I do not have a, an evergreen cartoon sitting around waiting uh, to pull out in case I don't get an idea. I remember about, I started at the Oregonian in 1983. One of my first days there, um, I went to my editor, Bob Landauer, who is very active and a very kicky 83 now. And he, I went in about 45 minutes to deadline and I said, at which was one o'clock, um, I said, you know, I don't, I, this is the first time in my career this has ever happened, but I just don't have a cartoon idea. And he has very blue eyes and he looked up at me and he said, you have to have an idea. That's what we pay you for. <laughs> and I got an idea almost the split second he said that, I ran back and did it. And it ran in Time Magazine the next week. Ah. <laughs> I'm not kidding. And you know, I've never, ever, ever had the problem with that since. <laughs> Matt, do you have an evergreen? Um, I usually have one or two evergreens lying around. I mean, and sometimes it's not always, it's not necessarily because of writer's block or something, but some days I'll get an idea for a cartoon and I'll realize that um, I really want to spend some time on it. Some of my mm -hmm. cartoons are really complicated and have a lot of detail and um, drawing five, six hours won't complete them. So the evergreen I can slide in and that buys me the time so that I can complete the more complicated ones. So, I mean, you probably have that idea, the same sort of thing, Jack, when you get an idea and you go, oh, this is a really good one. I mean, one of the, one of the greatest compliments cartoonists get is that when history textbooks call up and um, they'll say, oh, you know, can we get this cartoon for a textbook? And sometimes you'll have an idea and you'll go, Oh, this is like textbook quality if I pull it off right. And then the other 99% of the cartoons that you do, you know, are gonna just end up in the recycling pile at the end of the week. Yeah, but... I think all my cartoons are textbook quality. <laughs> oh. No, I no, look, I <laughs> here's here's the deal. Um we are doing 300 cartoons a year. And you know, whether we have time to ponder whether it's textbook quality or not. I do cartoons that I send to Matt Worker every week. And and this is kind of a joke with us where, you know, I'll say something like good columns, you know, like those Corinthian or Ionic or Doric or whatever, you know, and 
and he'll you know be like yeah that was th those were amazing columns and then he won't use it um there's some right there ionic and doric yeah right there uh, on the front. look at that there they are. And, and you know the thing is is that we we're craftsmen and and we care about what we and crafts women and we care about what we do Cra and it, i do and matt does and a lot of other cartoonists do and some of them don't but um i think that it's very important to uh do something that you're proud of every day even if it takes you you know sometimes we do only have an hour and a half or two hours or an hour or 45 minutes right. i mean i i for example harris uh you know i'm in california and i didn't i was quite frankly stunned that Kamala Harris was named as Biden. And, I, you know, shows how astute I am. I didn't, I didn't have an evergreen sitting there waiting or an idea. And I just thought, okay, I got an idea. I mean, I literally had an hour to do it. And it was a rather simple idea. And it worked out fine. So Wait, like, what was it? Oh, hell, I can't even remember. Okay. Oh, okay. it was Biden and Harris and, and you know, just kind of a straightforward character, both of them like this, and 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 she's saying, uh, or no, Biden says, "Hey, you were right. That girl was you." Think right. about it. Yeah. So yeah. you know, or that that I didn't say that girl or that little girl, but it was it was a play off that. Yeah. So it's just like a line and two people, and mm -hmm. you know, you can do. I'm sure Matt's had this experience too, where you can do like the most amazing drawing and nobody gives a damn. And then the next day you'll do something with Trump sitting at a desk with the, and they'll go, that's the instant classic, you know? And you're like, no, that's that's complete garbage, man. I'm phoning it in, but see you tomorrow. You know? <laughs> uh, I've got one more question for you. And then I think we will um, we will wrap this up, but this is uh, from Mary Lou Cooper and, and uh, Matt, we'll throw this to you. Aside from the presidency, what's your favorite topic? Oh God, I'm going to sound so crunchy and granola, but uh, environmental cartoons, you know, climate change, anything about the environment. I mean, I, re I remember starting out when I, back in the 1960s in LA, and there was this guy, uh, Ron Cobb, who died this year. He did these great early cartoons about, back then they called it the ecology movement. And uh, that, they were very formative for me. Mm -hmm. And so anytime I get to do stuff that's approaching Cobb quality, I'm pretty happy. Very good. That card going, I probably, I think I did it in an hour and a half. And I got the idea very quickly. Um, I, the question is, uh, what what's our favorite subject? I like drawing fish. I think you'll enjoy this book, Fear Fly Fishing by Jack Owen. No, um, I'm very, living in California, I'm really into climate right now. Um, that's a, That's a favorite subject for me. Um, I also am very interested in any sort of structural political reform, cartoons, um, campaign finance, um, corporate money and politics. Uh, you know, those are things that you could just keep going to over and over and over again. And, um, you know, that energizes me uh, from a topical point of view. Well, terrific. Um, thank you. Thank you both so much. There I am. Um, that was wonderful. As, as you all know, we have uh, Antelmates coming back and Cal's coming back. Uh, they were here uh, two years ago for the first journalism under fire and, and just kind of blew us away with, uh, with their uh, stories and with their cartoons and so on. Um, How so, did we do? What's that? How did we do? You did fantastically. Just <laughs> so much so well, that you'll have to come to Santa Fe next year when we have this. Uh, yeah, okay. yeah, we Matt and I get 10,000 bucks a piece, but we'll see it when we see it. <laughs> we have a great cartoonist here, Ricardo Cate. He did some cartoons for us for the first journalism under fire, and he publishes regularly in a bunch of different New Mexico uh, publications. His, uh, his cartoons called Without Reservations is typically a native view on the wider world, and uh, it's, it's fascinating. He's, if you haven't checked out his work, check him out. He's, uh, he's oh. really awesome. Um, well, thank you both very much. Thank you, Dana, once again. Uh, a quick reminder to you folks out there, tomorrow we have two things happening. The first, we're sending our video on demand link out where you can all watch the documentary film, A Thousand Cuts. This is all about the legendary Philippine journalist, Maria Ressa, 
and her amazing struggles against the Philippine government and how, how many, I don't know how many times she's been arrested and imprisoned for her work. Um, so you watch the documentary over the weekend, and then Monday at six o'clock Mountain Time, we'll be talking to Maria from Manila and the filmmaker Ramona Diaz as well. And we'll have Dana uh, interviewing both of them. And then tomorrow at 10 Mountain, we have our first conference interactive session where uh, Dana and myself will be fielding questions and having some talk about a lot of the panels that happened this week and some of the major issues that have come out and some things that, that you have that you wanna talk about that, that you're interested in. Um, so it will be a webinar, but there'll be lots of chances for you to uh, use your microphone and, and even your video and, and appear and, and tell your story, tell your, ask your question and, and your comment. So that's tomorrow at 10. And on that note, um, I thank all of you very, very much. That was uh, wonderful. And uh, as Dana said before, you have to come to Santa Fe now. Great. Thank you, Sandy. Yeah. yeah. No way, man. I'm not going there. It's too far. No, it's a great place. It's a great place. <laughs>